So I would guess that most people out there have heard this parable many times before. And if you were asked it, you could probably tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan and get most of it right. You know, you might not get it word for word the way it comes out of there, but you would at least be able to communicate. If somebody were to say, well, tell me what the Good Samaritan is, is all about, you'd at least be able to get the general story. And, and so sometimes when we have something that's very familiar to us, I think it is good to be able to take a step back. Um, you know, because sometimes we get like we, uh, we say the Lord's Prayer and we may, we may hear the words as they come out of our mouth, but we may no longer think about it. Or we may do the things that we do throughout worship um, and we, they just may become so much a routine that we don't think about what we're doing anymore. And so as, as I begin this, uh, I keep looking over there and I expect the screen to be on. And again, it's one of those things that talking about getting used to something, you get used to certain things and don't expect a, a bulb to go out between services. Um, you know, you get used to the way things are and you get used to hearing things a certain way. And, and sometimes you think that's the way it always is. And for those of you who don't know, um, I grew up in Texas and I, I uh, lived in Texas from when I was born to when I graduated college. And then in 1995, I went and I didn't come back to Texas until 2014. And so one of the realities that I grew up with in Texas that I thought was everywhere was fences. You know, and every every house had a fence between it, and, and I just thought this was the way it always was. And, and we didn't travel much outside of Texas when I was growing up. And so, and again, coming from San Antonio, you have to travel a long way to get to anywhere outside of Texas. But... I just assumed everybody lived like this. Everybody had fences. And so um, I was surprised. I, I maybe kind of noticed it a little bit when I was in Louisiana, but I really noticed it for the first time when I was in Iowa. I was in seminary up in Iowa, and nobody had fences. Nobody. And, and I was sitting here thinking, well, so these people, they have their gardens out in the backyard and everything, and, well, what keeps somebody from going and just picking you know, things out of other people's gardens? Nobody does that. Well, how do they how do they keep their dogs from just going out and running wild or all these other things, you know? Well, they didn't really have that problem up there. And I didn't realize it, and it wasn't until several years later when I realized that, you know, this, this cultural affection for fences is a very Texas thing. You know, uh, so part of Texas history is Texas was, is and was a big cattle driving country. So people would drive their cattle from one area of Texas to another. So um, Fort Worth was where they was one of the places they would drive them up to the rail station. But if you had property and you didn't have your land fenced off, well, cattle think crops taste every bit as good or better than grass does. So if you didn't have your fin property fenced off, and this this caused a lot of conflict between ranchers and farmers, and so you ended up with barbed wire fences everywhere. And, and eventually, this fences kind of trans, they moved into the city. And so people who lived in the country with fences built cities uh, with fences. And so now we have HOAs that tell us you know, not only have to have a fence, but you have to have, have to be this tall and be this color and be in this kind of repair and, and everything like that. And, and what is the fence doing? Well, it may be keeping your dogs in or it may be um, shielding your, your backyard from view by other people. But it's not really protecting us from cattle anymore. And in fact, the fences that we have wouldn't keep a cow out anyway. But I was also, as I was thinking about this, there's, um, there's a famous poem by Robert uh, Frost called The Mending Wall. It's the, it's the poem to where the, the line that gets quoted from this poem often is, good, wa uh, good fences make good neighbors. And, and I think a lot of people think that's what the poem is all about, but the reality is this is a, a poem about going around a, a rock wall and, and, you know, at the end of the season because, you know, you have hunters, they go through the wall, so they go through your property and they take out a space where they can walk through and you have the weather kind of makes the wall fall apart eventually and everything. So they had to go back and they, these weren't walls that were held together by cement or anything, so they went back and they would basically every spring redo this wall and, and the, the one neighbor on the other side of the, the wall says, well, good good walls, good neighbors make. And the rest of the poem is Robert Frost basically saying, but why? Does it really make 
good neighbors? Is it is this really what it's about? Well, who really doesn't want a good wall? Well, elves don't want a wall. Foxes don't want a wall. Dogs don't want a wall. Uh, hunters don't want a wall. And he's he's beginning to think of all these reasons why the the wall doesn't necessarily make good neighbors. And and again, it's just it's that for me, it was just one of those things that kind of reinforced uh, that you know just because this is the way I grew up with it doesn't mean that it's the way it always is. And and this happens all the time. So I, I remember I was up in Iowa and I was a uh, listening to a person give a presentation, and they were talking about, um, and I just come from Louisiana, so they were talking about a town in Louisiana. Now, you, you, if you spell the town's name, it's N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S. And I guess most people, when they see that, would say Natchitoches. And so this person was talking about all the, this, this event that happened in Natchitoches over and over and over and over again. About the fifth time, I said, you know, if you'd ever been there, you realize the town is actually pronounced Natchitoches. You, you would never know that unless you'd been there, though. And, uh, and again, Zach is a town right on the Texas-Louisiana border, kind of a charming little town, but back to the sermon. Um, you know, it's there are times where we assume this is the way people think about things. And there's lots of times where reality is that just because we assume that that's the way it is everywhere else, that's not necessarily the way it is. And I, I think one of the great gifts of uh, a lot of, of artists have given us over the years is these times where they they go and they imagine they they think about things in a different way. So um, you know the as I was thinking about this, I thought about a lot of different songs. So everybody from John Lennon with his uh, song Imagine to Nickelback with a song called If Everybody Cared, and but they're all talking about this idea of well, what would the world be like? What would the world be like if if we actually cared for one another? If we actually took care of one another, if we actually saw and, and paid attention to one another, and there are all kinds of reasons why we don't do this, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, John Lennon singing about imagine there's no borders or, um, or all these other things, or, man, it's, it's one of these things to where that's not the world that we live in. That's not the world that we, we inhabit from day to day, but can we imagine a world perhaps as it should be, perhaps as it could be? And I do think that's one of the things that Jesus does here. So I have a lot of compassion for the lawyer in this story. A lot of people don't. A lot of people are are very hard on the lawyer in the story. But if you uh, if you were here last week, I know Adam was, was preaching last week, and the lesson last week was where Jesus sends out the seventy disciples. So this is right after the disciples have returned. So they've come back and they've reported to Jesus what has happened while they were out and doing their ministry, and as they're celebrating their this kind of return of the disciples, right then, this is, this is the then um, at that point where the, the, the lawyer comes up and asks Jesus the question. And a lot of people say, well, okay, here's, here's this lawyer, he's testing Jesus. And on the one hand, yeah, I think for me, this is a person who has heard the disciples go out and heard this message that they have. And he comes back and he wants to, to figure out, well, okay, I've, this is what I've heard from your disciples, but who are you, Jesus? What is it that you believe? What is it that you are teaching? And so he asks this question and says, well, what must I do to have this life that you and your disciples are talking about? And Jesus says, well, okay, you know what the, the scripture said. What do you read there? You know, and so the, the lawyer replies, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And your neighbor is yourself. And, and I love... Jesus answer to this, and, and I, I have, I have a very specific way in which I hear this answer because it's almost like, it's it's almost kind of flippant. You've given the right answer. Do this, and you'll live. You've given the right answer. You know what to do. So do this, and you'll live. But again, I love the, the and then the question comes. But but who is my neighbor? And I think that's an interesting question. I think that's an interesting question because it's a question that we all wrestle with in some respects. And so Jesus does tell this story about a man who's going down on this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And, and it's a road that is a road that's very dangerous to travel on. It was that dangerous in that time. It's still not one of the safest roads in the world, but it, it's, it's, it's a very steep road. It's a road with high walls on both sides. It's a place where ambushes did happen. And so the story that Jesus tells is a story that people would know about. A story about a person who goes down this road and gets ambushed by bandits, and is left on the side of the road with nothing, clinging on for life. 
And there may be times where this road would be nobody else traveling on, and so this type of thing could happen. But by chance, not one, not two, but three people end up passing him on the road. The first one being a priest, the second one being a Levite. And these are both people who, you know, and I'm not here to, there's lots of reasons why they may not have stopped, and there's lots of debates about this, but ultimately, the, the story works on the logic that these are people who should have seen this person, should have seen this person matters, and should have stopped and should have aided. That knew what God asked the people more than anybody else. And so, but what do they do? They see, not only do they pass by, they go to the other side of the road, get out of the way, and go by on the other side of the road. And then a Samaritan comes by, and he sees, and he's moved with pity, and he stops, and he draws close, and he brings the man, and he places him up on his own... Uh, on his own transportation, and he brings him to the inn, and he um, he takes care of him that night, and then he pays the innkeeper to continue to take care of him and promises to reimburse his expenses whenever he returns. And the, again, a lot of times the the end where the Jesus asks, and who was the one who who was neighbor to this man? Uh, a lot of people will critique the uh, the lawyer because he says, well, he doesn't say the Samaritan; he says the one who showed mercy. But I think he picks up on the right thing. It's not that whether the man was a Samaritan or a priest or a Levite that mattered whether he was a neighbor or not. It's the fact that he showed mercy. It was the one who showed mercy. Now, why don't we show mercy sometimes? I, I certainly have been guilty of this. I know others probably have too, to where you see someone who is in need and you pass by on the other side of the road or you say, well, I don't need to acknowledge you today. I do think there are these times where we say, well, this person is not worthy of my care, of my compassion. And there have been lots of times throughout uh, throughout the story of us as people where we've said to, uh, about other people, well, no, they're not worthy of my time, of my attention, of my love, of my compassion. They're not, they're not worth as much as I am. So there, to me, there's kind of two ways of, of approaching this question. So I think the, the question gets asked from the perspective of, you know, who's my tribe? Who are my people? Who are the people who I have to care about? Who is my neighbor? You know, what's that What's that boundary? And we all deal with this in certain respects, you know. And, you know, within, uh, within the Constitution, so I don't know how many people actually know this, within the Constitution, one of the compromises that was made in the Constitution when it was written, um, you had the northern and the southern states, and within the southern states, you had a lot of the population that was slaves. So how do you count them? In the Constitution, slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person for representation. Which to us, I mean, this has been, it's been uh, amended, it's been taken out, but in this Constitution, when it was written, uh, a person who was a slave did not count as a full person. That seems weird to us today. That seems harsh to us today. That seems just wrong to us today, and it should. But I think another thing to realize is over half the people in this room, two generations ago, you wouldn't have been able to vote. I mean, it's, things have changed. The way we view people has changed. And I'm not going to, you know, I, I think it's hard to go back and view things through the lens of the way people viewed them at a certain point. But I do think that there are these times where we are told, you know, these people matter and these people don't matter. This is, this is your tribe, this is not. And, and it happens all the time, you know, whether it's between different political parties, or whether it's between different groups of people. And so that's one way that you can answer the question, well, what, what is my tribe? What are the people who matter? But the way Jesus answers it actually goes to the other, expect, the other side of it, which is kind of the all side. And so the all side, you know, in, in U.S. history kind of goes back to the Declaration uh, of Independence. You know, we hold that all people have these certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, did Thomas Jefferson think that that all included everybody who would be sitting here today? No. Honestly, he didn't. But ultimately, you know, when Jesus talks about this idea of who is neighbor, and he uses the idea of a, he uses the person of a Samaritan to say, well, this is the person who acts with mercy, this is neighbor, you know, he leans into that. That this is their direction. So, you know, it's not because a person is of a certain group or of a certain boundary, you know, and every time I've tried to, we all grow up with this. I mean, I, I grew up in my life saying, you know, okay, here's the people who I know, and here's the people who I can love, and, you know, 
God kept putting me in different experiences and that boundary kept shifting further and further and further away. And I got to tell you, I mean, where I am is, you know, quite honestly, God deals with us as people. We are, you know, as people of God, we deal with people as people, not as, you know, any particular group. And, you know, I don't care. I don't care whether a person's a Democrat or Republican or somewhere in between or, you know, on the extremes of either group. I don't care. I'm called to love them. I don't care whether a person is married or divorced, whether they are, are gay or straight. I don't care. I'm called to love them. I don't care whether they are, are Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or atheist. I, you know, ultimately, I, I encounter them as neighbor first. I don't care whether they came from, uh, you know, central, their native, their, their origins come out of Central America or South America or Asia or Europe or Africa or you know, if there's anybody who actually comes out of Antarctica, I don't know. Um, it doesn't matter to me. You know, it doesn't mean that I don't see things and I don't have my own things that blind me. I, I do. I, I know that. And I work on that. But, you know, I do think that what Jesus wants us to see is that this other person is a person who is worthy of our compassion, worthy of our love, worthy of our mercy, worthy of grace. I love the song that uh, that Kevin was leading us in at the very beginning. Uh, if we are the body, you know, um, why aren't his hands reaching? You know, and and that sense that I do think that a lot of people feel sometimes in church to where I've not been welcomed, I've not been included, I've not been seen or heard or valued, or I, I don't have a place. And I know I'm an idealist. I know that you know, like the, you know, whether. John Lennon or anybody else sing songs about, you know, the world as it could be. I, I, I look at the world as it could be, you know. And if we are the body, I do think that we can be those hands that reach, those, those feet that go out to, those mouths that speak words of compassion to, those eyes that actually see and look at a person and know that they matter. And I know that we fight against a long history of people saying, but this is, the, this is your tribe and stick to your tribe. This is your group. Stick to your group. You know? And yet the gospel calls us beyond that. It calls us to be something different. You know, and I think the gospel wants us to imagine a world to where the person who sees and passes by on the other side of the road is the exception and not the rule. Where it's not just the, the Samaritan, but also the priests and the Levites and the Benjaminite, and the Roman, and, and everybody else as they pass by, that they would see and be moved by compassion and go and investigate and stop and interrupt their journey and do what it takes. And may, when others see us, you know, may they know, as, as we sang just before this, may they know that we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, may they know that we are Christians. By our love. You know, I think one of the great things that Jesus does a lot of things is Jesus takes a question and he, he answers it a lot of times with a story. And as at those times where we know the right answer. We know where to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. And where we want, at those times where we wonder, well, but who is my neighbor? Who is that one that I'm to see and show compassion to? Who is that one that I'm to love as myself? May we also continue to remember this story where a Samaritan stops, sees, cares for, acts, brings him to his own place, makes sure that his care is provided for, and may we also see and act and go and do likewise. So may you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. And may we, as we go from this place, go and do likewise. Amen.